Hello all, Rick here again. In Star Trek, warp nacelles are needed for warp travel, but they are not the only methodology in generating a subspace field. For example, the Vulcans favoured a warp ring design before they threw their lot in with Starfleet. There were originally rules cited for the construction of starships, however many of these have long since been contradicted in favour of creating better designs. One of the original stipulations was that the nacelles had to be in pairs, so no odd numbers, and they had to be aligned to have mostly an unobstructed view of one another. However, even in TOS, many ships simply ignored these design principles, showing that in the canon of the shows there are multiple ways to generate warp speeds without adhering to the supposed rules set out. The Viserius of the First Federation, and then later the Kazon or Voth from Voyager, Borg ships, Cardassians, and many, many more. Nevertheless, Starfleet vessels in particular do seem to prefer using twin nacelles, but are not against using odd numbers, and certainly they eventually invalidate the rule that declares they need to maintain line of sight. As a quick aside, the warp nacelles derive their name from the structure of the same name on an aircraft, which I did not actually know. The turbine engine on a jet, for example, is a nacelle or pod, and the attaching arm is the pylon, so yeah, I didn't actually know that. In fact, the reason they were placed where they are was because designer Matt Jeffries felt that they may be dangerous and complex pieces of machinery that would be better served being positioned far away from the habitable areas of the ship. Additionally, their location made swapping out the nacelles easier should upgrades be needed. This logic could translate well into the fictional lore of Star Trek II, with all the same logic applied. There are old references to them producing much radiation internally when in operation, which I would not be surprised to learn. Intuitively, I don't want to be inside an active warp nacelle. In the Next Generation era, we also see that there is a potent drive plasma stream that funnels between the warp coils too while in use. In Apocrypha, Starfleet has tested out other nacelle configurations simply for that purpose, to test them out, to see how they perform. When three nacelle designs were tested initially, they did indeed increase warp drive by a proportional amount, however the third nacelle also exacerbated existing instabilities in the subspace fields, leading to a more temperamental drive. However, further advancements could sort out this drawback. So especially during the 23rd century, the optimal configuration was to have just the two nacelles for stability and power distribution. Any more was excessive, and any less was limiting. Discovery added the Nimitz and Cardenas class starships, both which had four nacelles, and these were rather large and bulky ones, I'll touch on that towards the end. One theoretical advantage of using four nacelles, or even three, is longer sustained warp travel at higher speeds. It's long been established that high warp factors have a limit on the length of time a ship can spend at them before the warp core has to go into an emergency shutdown. It could be a similar thing with the nacelles themselves. A ship can go to warp using one pair as primary full power ones and the second pair at partial power. It can then switch to the secondary pair and make them the full power ones, lessening the burden on the first pair, effectively pacing itself. This was referred to as warp coasting, and something the Constellation class was very apt at, as well as presumably all other multi-nacelle designs. Additionally, the four nacelles allowed the vessel to negate the usual drain on power reserves that preparing for a warp jump would entail, so it was less vulnerable to attack in certain situations. The Sagan class is the successor to the Constellation class and entered service in the 2400s and was an incredibly advanced science vessel that incorporated all sorts of newer technologies such as extensive reverse engineered Borg tech and multiphasic shielding. We've yet to get to see much more of it in action, if anything, but the ship was designed to be an explorer too. The Cheyenne class also had four nacelles. Fun fact, they were originally made from marker pens. The class of Starship had a top speed of warp 9.6, but it predated the Galaxy class although just barely. Its role was that of a deep space explorer, and also expected patrol and possible battle duties. The Niagara class was simply made with three nacelles, to distinguish its silhouette easily, as different vessel types built in-universe. 
It was created in 2349 as an experiment in sustained high warp speeds, reaching 9.6, the same speed as the Galaxy class whose nacelles would be based on this design, although the Galaxy only has the two. Now, this is speculation on my part, but I assume that with multiple nacelles too, you could have greater manoeuvrability at warp. Theoretically, you could alter the subspace warp bubble much more easily with two or more nacelles, perhaps altering the geometry of the warp field, and allowing it to turn and angle at a more effective rate. This effect would be multiplied with more nacelles, akin to all four wheels of a car turning, or even simply four-wheel drive. Additionally, if a nacelle is damaged with a single pair, then that is the ship's warp drive crippled, whereas if a ship had four, then that is less of a hindrance to it. One special instance of multi-nacelle design was the Prometheus class, which had four visible nacelles at the rear and a further two concealed in the saucer section that would deploy from the top and bottom when the ship separated into three parts. This allowed each section to enter warp on its own, and yes, that means each section had its own warp core. When separate, each could travel at a fraction of the Prometheus's full speed, but when united, the four nacelles worked in tandem to allow for very high speeds of up to warp 9.99. On the flip side, we have many designs with only one nacelle, such as the Hermes, Saladin, and Kelvin classes in the 23rd century and the Freedom class of the 24th. The Hermes and the Saladin were nearly identical, with the Hermes having less armaments and crew. The Hermes operated as a scout ship most of the time, not engaging in combat, but science missions. This in particular is also very similar to the USS Archer NCC-627 that was seen in Strange New Worlds, but that vessel was very small in comparison and staffed only by a handful of crew and designed pretty much simply to scout out to local systems for contact purposes, and had light scientific duties. It is possible that the Archer is supposed to be the Hermes or Saladin class's first appearance in the hull instead of a background image, but until confirmed I'll treat it as a different class with the same mission profile. We also have the Kelvin class, or Einstein class in non-canon sources, which is dated as early as 2196. And although added by the Kelvin timeline films, it drew its designs from the aforementioned 22nd century vessels, and is also possibly one of the first single nacelled ship designs. Like the others mentioned here, its role was that of a survey ship, although a fairly well armed one. The Freedom class is a much larger single nacelled vessel that was from the 24th century and developed out of the Galaxy class program. The ship was longer than previous single nacelled designs at 430 meters, but it too was considered a light survey vessel and not one for the cutting edge of frontline deep space exploration, more like charting a nearby nebula or a planetary survey mission. Its speeds were nothing to be sniffed at either, it could make a maximum of warp 9.2, which is outshone by its contemporaries, but still respectable. The common link between these ships seems to be that they are all survey vessels, or some form of science ship made for light work, and neither pushing the front line of exploration or engaging in extensive combat. So it could be that having a single nacelle to generate a warp field is all that is needed when efficiency and long-term travel are not required. This relegates most of these designs to lighter duties. When it comes to multiple nacelles beyond two? Well, it seems the reasons are numerous too. And firstly, it allows for warp coasting, higher sustained warp travel using older warp systems. Secondly, it provides a tactical benefit, both for power usage, apparently, and in case of damage in combat. Thirdly, it may allow for even greater flexibility at warp, or even quite simply higher speeds or a quicker acceleration through warp factors. We only see them on ships that are either designed for combat or as deep space explorers. Of course, as technology has evolved in the Star Trek universe, there are likely exceptions to these generalizations, and a sufficiently advanced nacelle could probably have any form. Look at the Intrepid classes hinged nacelles for a smart warp system, 
or how the number or size of a ship's nacelles has very little bearing on its performance. For example, or the fact that the Galaxy class was a powerhouse of a ship with only its two. In fact, piggybacking off this point, it could be that older vessels like the Nimitz and Cardinus class had four nacelles for the reason of higher warp speeds, especially in the Discovery era ships we can see that the nacelles were square and bulky before switching to the cylindrical ones seen in TOS and mostly beyond. From the tale of Yard 39 we hear that this was down to a design shift from the whole warp system transitioning to a more conservative model as simply building bigger nacelles with more warp coils was only going to get you so far and so fast. Starfleet needed to adapt and change its approach to nacelles otherwise they would get ridiculous. Just look at the crossfields nacelle to hull ratio for example. The Discovery and Glen were some of the final ships of that era with the increasingly oversized square nacelles. Overall the reason for having a variety in nacelle design is quite simply because it looks cool to play with different designs and it creates a more interesting fleet. But the thing is this is probably similar to the in-universe explanation too in that Starfleet can theorise and plan out designs on paper as much as they want but at the end of the day sometimes the only way to test a new design is to build them and see how they fly. Sometimes these outcomes find a place in the fleet at large and you get a new class of starship with a unique look to it. Sometimes vessels that look similar but fulfil different roles. And sometimes you get a ship that has six nacelles because it can split into three like a mad lad. Thanks for watching this video. There was a lot of theory crafting here but it was all drawn from different non-canonical sources over the years. I've been Rick and I'll see you later for another lore video. Thanks again and goodbye.